I was actually out of the area uh, on a hunting trip uh, with a couple friends. We were up in Modoc hunting and uh, you know we'd been planning for the trip for a long time. It was a good time with our friends, you know, it was a beautiful night, you know, it was, it was amazing. Um, it was a very, very relaxed, normal Sunday. I had done my Sunday morning chores, uh, which is some yard work, some watering, uh, and kind of settled to the fact I was going to do a few chores inside and then really just be lazy. It was a great day. It was, it was beautiful. My wife and I went out for a walk, took the dog, and went to Riverfront Park and swam the dog and it was beautiful and we were walking back to the car and she goes, you know, I haven't felt this content in a long time. I was driving on um, East Side Road, which is overgrown with trees and canopy and it was so windy, it, it, I moved to the middle lane just thinking, well, what if one of these trees comes down? I can just remember thinking to myself, I've never been in winds like this in Santa Rosa. The, the wind early on was so intense that even my heavy frame, I found myself having to get propped up against my truck from time to time. We all just noticed it was a weird night. It was really hot, it was really windy, and the bulk of my night started um, a few blocks away from the studio, actually, with um, kind of a large fire in a field. Scott Bristow, the captain, came on and said, I've got a fully involved structure with fire going down the creek and the fire's going up into the backyards of other homes and we're starting to get multiple structures going. Almost all the resources for the city got diverted there. Uh, we had two alarms, so both ladder trucks, six engines, multiple chiefs, including the fire chief Tony Gosner. All these people showed up there. It was a challenge to, to get that fire under control. From 6 p.m. to midnight, we had 20 reported vegetation fires and 10 reported structure fires. That's before the Tubbs fire even came into the city of Santa Rosa. Probably like 12.30, it got really windy and she had a water bottle sitting on the windowsill and it blew off the windowsill and hit me in the head and woke me up and I smelled the smoke. I'm gonna go down to the end of the block and see what's going on because I'm worried about the trees. And I got down to the end of the street and I could see the glow on the hill. And so I told her that I was gonna go to work because I had to get it. there was a fire engine there I wanted to get out in case they needed it. The city dispatcher called me and she said, uh, when she said she made it sound so, uh, so big, she said uh, because the wind was blowing, even our house was shaking, was strong wind. And uh, she called and she said, uh, Ms. Finn, I don't know uh, what to tell you, but the city is upside down. I went down there, the police was uh, covering the streets, the wind was so strong. The minute we put the barricade, the wind blows them off. As I was going over Fountain Grove, uh, I made contact with Station 5 and told the captain. Uh, we had a conversation about we need to upstaff our reserve rigs. And he, uh, Don Ritchie, the captain, goes, you know, we should really think about all calling the, the entire department. I said, that's a great idea. We call the entire department. We'll staff all the reserve rigs. If we need them, great. If we don't, you know, so be it. It's the first time we've all called the department in probably 15 years. When I got that call that night from the fire chief, um, I, I, the first words out of my mouth, do I need to get to the emergency operations center? And he said yes. Um, even then, I really didn't know the magnitude, but when I got to the emergency operations center, uh, the team had already set up uh, the entire facility. Um, we were, the, the legal team was in the process of drafting um, uh, my emergency declaration for the city. 78 strike teams ordered. There was, the EOC was open, the entire department was called back. So there was a lot of work before the, the fire even came in, not knowing if the fire was even gonna come in. Had not seen any flames yet, drove by a few deputies that I know, and they told me that they were just doing evacuations. A lot of what we were doing felt precautionary. Yeah, I didn't think in this day and age that a fire could get that out of control um, in such an urban area. By one o'clock, a little after one o'clock, um, I got a call from Paul Lowenthal, who's uh, assistant fire marshal, and he goes, we got fire at Cross Creek. It's coming up Cross Creek now. Well, that's the base of Fountain Grove. It was one o'clock in the morning. It's like, oh my God, it's already here. How's this, you know? I called Neil, our emergency preparedness coordinator, who's now in, in the city. At the EOC, we need evacuations, evacuate the Fountain Grove area down to Montecito Heights, get everyone out. Well, pretty soon, I look to the left of Kmart, there's a column of black smoke coming up. The only 
place that was over there was Mountain Mike's Pizza. I says, hey, Mountain Mike's is on fire. We need to send a fire engine over there. We have no fire engines. Everyone is busy. You know, and I called dispatch and said, I, is there any available resources in Santa Rosa? We have zero. There are no available resources in Santa Rosa. I asked them to do an all call for the entire county. Send out a page in the entire county. Any available resource needs to respond to Santa Rosa for a wildland urban interface fire. We decided to um, set up at fire station three in Santa Rosa and operate the incident from there. And so in helping the chief do that, um, it wasn't but just a few minutes into it, you know, there were reports of, you know, Kaiser potentially either considering the evacuation or being impacted by fire. And so he said, hey, get over there right away, figure out, let me know what's going on with Kaiser. I remember driving the first part of this loop um, to try to get to back to the other side to see if, you know, I forgot anyone or if anyone needed help. When I first drove past it, I saw smoke and that was it. And then it wasn't 10 minutes later when I drove past that it was just a wall of flames barreling down the side of the hill. Clear public right of way and it doesn't matter where you are. You see something down blocking the right of way, clear it because you never know. It could become a main avenue for, for evacuation. So I blocked the fast lane of traffic on westbound Fountain Grove and started bucking and dragging the trees myself to clear the lane of traffic. You know, those people, I would imagine, coming over from Napa County um, that it never had reason to go over the top of Fountain Grove. And then you're being chased by fire and you're being told to get out by EMS and there's lights and there's noise. And um, I even had people pull up next to me when I was actively using a chainsaw and focusing and there's loud noise and they were asking me how to get out of here, you know, and all I could tell them was keep going downhill, keep going downhill. Well, I first learned what was happening when my son knocked on my bedroom door because I hadn't woken up um, with the wind or anything and get up, I think um, the fire's, a fire is getting close to our house and I had no idea. We went out in the front yard and as soon as we opened the front door, we could see the glow of the fire coming over the wiki up hills. And I live in the Mark West Estates area. And the sound was like a freight train, which we had never heard before. I remember seeing a couple of the officers that had already been doing evacuations and just just seeing the look on their faces and knowing what they'd been through. Patty Seffens, I remember her just having her, her face was just black, smeared with uh, just soot. Um, she was coughing, clearly had smoke inhalation. And then you kind of just realize at that point, like, hey, these guys have, you know, in the time that it took us to drive down and get ready, these guys have been through hell for the last couple hours before we got here. I got a call from our transit office um, that the emergency operations center had been activated and they needed buses to do evacuations. I told my wife, I said, look, this is bad, I gotta go in. And I got, I got dressed and when I got there, the place was buzzing. There was a few other drivers that had arrived and uh, the instructions I got, they needed buses to go to Mendocino Avenue and Fountain Grove and there would be first responders there to tell us where to go. We got ready to go to work after my supervisor gave me a call, came in, jumped on the highway coming southbound and it looked like it was, you know, traffic time, like five, six o'clock, you know, in the afternoon, you know, just traffic jam and you, you look up at the hillside and it's just glowing orange. And it's like, wow, that's when it like hits you, like what is going on. The magnitude of what was going on occurred later. I think once we, him and I hit the streets and we actually got out to Journey's End Mobile Home Park. And I think that's kind of when it really set in that this was something just that we'd never experienced before. How close are you? How close is the fire? The fire is right there in some cases where it's burning the trailer right next door, but they're hitting each trailer as they go and leapfrogging through this trailer park trying to get people out. Chief says, hey, they were getting reports there's fire at Journey's End Mobile Home Park. Can you give me an update? And so it wasn't just a couple seconds later, I was able to go, come up over the overpass. And I said, you know, Chief, consider Journey's End Mobile Home Park a total loss. Stand by for Kaiser. There was a period of time when I was at the evacuation center running around crazy trying to organize as much as I could. I called my wife and she said, I'm in the backyard putting flames out in the backyard. And at that moment, I just said, leave, <laughs> get out of there. <laughs> Sorry, that's obviously part of that's emotional <laughs> um, because uh, it's real. And my wife called and we've been together. My wife and I have been together since high school. And I said, hey, how's it going? She's like, hey, it's really bad here. 
And I said, okay, how bad? And she said, well, the fire came from, from Calistoga, I think, and there's a bunch of fires, and it, and, and it jumped 101, and it's in Coffee Park. Wait a minute, how come there's, was, there's a, a fire in Coffee Park? She said, no, it was a, it's a huge fire, and it's jumped 101. Those flames were literally jumping over two lanes of roadway without even touching the ground. They were, it was like they were just carried on, on a wind that was 10 or 12 feet off the ground. What we decided to do, because we have two dogs, let's just all go in the truck and so we don't get separated. So we all got in his truck and drove down the street and then we saw that it was bumper to bumper traffic. And as we were getting in his truck, I looked down at my phone and I saw that the city's EOC had contacted me to come in and um, work. So I'm like, all right, well, let's go to Finley and I'll work. However, when we got on the freeway, the fire had just crossed the freeway. So we were headed south on 101 and they closed the freeway and they were making everybody do a U-turn and head north. So I called in to work and said I wasn't going to make it right then because we couldn't come south. And so when my wife woke me at about two in the morning, it's the last thing I'm like, what are you talking about? we've got this fire going, or there's the fires coming our way. And I was kind of like in denial because I live in Coffee Park area. That was way over in Napa, and that's not here in Santa Rosa. We're on the other side of the freeway. So there's a little bit of that disbelief that my wife is saying, no, Tom, I'm serious, it's coming. Once I got the bus parked, um, they were just running to the bus with you know, people, you know, very fragile people. Uh, in wheelchairs and in different states of dementia. Most of them, like probably 90% of them, couldn't move on their own. Uh, many had to be carried in um, and it was, it was painful for them and they were, they were getting rousted out of bed at 2, 3 in the morning to do this. I turned right on uh, Fountain Grove Parkway again heading towards Mendocino Avenue and you're coming down a hill and I got this crazy view of the Journey's End Mobile Home Park. The entire thing was just engulfed. It looked like every single unit in that park was on fire. My primary role was to maintain or those stations running. You know, as once the, you know that first day or came in, and the next day we'd come in and work out. We were working the 12-hour shift, so we'd come in at two in the morning, and then we'd go around to the, all the different stations, make sure those were running, make sure we assessed the all of our different facilities, whether it was a reservoir, whether it was a a uh, wet well, whether it's a pump station for uh, water, for the water system, or a lift station for the sewer system, and making sure that the infrastructure was also, you know, there was no broken pipes, there was no sewer spilling out of manholes. Um, if there was uh, trees that needed to be cut up and move out of the way so people could get through, and, um, just basically drive around and assess our, our infrastructure. It felt like it was going 100 miles an hour. A lot of us, you know, had been working at this point more than half our shift. Our cars were running out of gas. It dawned on me that um, my house was um, just a few hundred yards north of where that fire was headed straight to. Six hours a week, my kids were home by themselves. And it was right in the middle of those six hours. My engineer Doug and for my firefighter Rob who came in and they were in right away, right in the early moments of the fire, they said that as they worked their way into Coffee Park, the fire was already, you know, it had just jumped the freeway and was working its way into Coffee Park. Um, and to hear them talk about the wind speed and the, the intensity of the fire was so great that they both knew that there was really nothing that you could do with an engine to stop the head of that fire. The head is being the the very tip or the point of the fire as it moves in one direction. And they knew right away, which is great, I mean, they made that recognition right away that if we try to get out front of this, we're gonna die and other people are gonna die. The best thing we can do is get people out of the way of this because in the end, you can rebuild. You can buy new cars, you can do whatever else. And they had that in their mind, but what you can't do is replace a human life. As I continued up Hopper Lane, there was the brick walls and I could look on both sides and see that Again, every house is on fire, every single one. And cars are flying past me, just people trying to get away. I'm looking at it, I'm just staring at it and going, how is every house on fire? What happened out here? This was the whole neighborhood, everything, everything. There wasn't, I couldn't see anything that wasn't on fire. 
When we were waking the neighbors up, there was, there was one lady who was a single mom and had three little kids. And she had come over just like two or three months before and introduced herself and her kids and left this, this note to read after she left. And it said, I just wanted my kids to know the neighbors because my cousin just died in a house fire. And if there's a problem, I want them to know where to go. So she was like one of the first things I thought about. I thought about that letter. So we went over to try and wake her up and I was pounding on the door and she wasn't coming to the door. And I was, I was telling my wife, I think I gotta break it down because she's not coming out. I know she's in there. And all of a sudden everything got really bright. I turned around and a tree in her front yard had caught on fire. Decided um, to take advantage of this opportunity to, to fly over. And we were actually traveling with a battalion chief. And he said that at one point, uh, he was with his group of firefighters. And they came up on this building that was a care facility. And he said, we can't evacuate, we don't have time to evacuate this building. And we can't let it burn. And it was, um, it was a striking comment. On Round Barn, we had a building that had 120 uh, people in it that we couldn't get out. So the decision was made, move them to the west side of the building. We parked three fire engines on there with the battalion chief and said, don't burn the building down. If you burn the building, you're gonna lose 120 people. So that's a hell of an order. Such a, a moment of dedication from, his, from that team of men and women that were there to fight that fire. It was, um, it will, I think it will always uh, stay with me. Literally running from door to door, knocking on people's door, and they could feel the fire coming in, they could feel the heat, and it was the glow and the ember casts, the ember showers just landing on them, and, and them taking the heat, trying to shield themselves as they went from door to door to try to um, rouse people and get them out of their homes, you know I mean? The, the fire started so, late at night that most people were in bed, which was the worst case scenario. There wasn't a whole lot that they could do except um, tell people to get the hell out and sell, save your life. Um, I needed to buy some time uh, to accomplish the evacuation of Kaiser, and there was a, a last set of, of, of uh, homes on Journey's End that were still there. And so we um, obtained a fire engine, finally found a fire engine, uh, and hold we on, cut on. holes through the fences of Kaiser hold and the mobile home park on. and got, got a line right, in there. And the plan pizza. was to just buy time. The minute I got off, there was a police, a fire department, sheriff blocking the street. And I didn't know what's going on, but I could see the fire was burning. And my house is like a block from that. So uh, I came to the police and I said, I live here, my kids are down there. My wife is down there, so uh, please let me in. They said nobody could go because all this place is burned. So my heart was blown. I, I, I don't know what to do. I was standing, I was crying, and all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, a car was coming from the dark. So it was my wife. She came out, and uh, they were so scared. The kids were yelling and screaming. Where were you? We were almost died and blah, blah. I was happy. I don't care whatever they were saying. I was happy to see them. Once I finally made it to the Finley shelter, this, the place was just lit up. It was just a buzz. There were cars stacked up on the street trying to get in. And I've got a bus full of fragile people that need to get off. So most of them needed wheelchairs and there weren't any. So they, uh, they wheeled out office chairs and, and just put them in office chairs and used those to wheel them in. It was uh, one of the greatest examples of an organized chaos I've ever seen. Um, there were people everywhere that were, you know, the, the uncertainty, the fear, the, 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 the sense of loss and all that, coupled with a huge contingent of people that were just there to help. Did a lot of improvising. Um, we grabbed uh, staff chairs from desk and we grabbed tables and we ran them out to ambulances and buses and loaded people on tables and in our chairs and rolled them in and unfortunately kind of laid them down how I say in like almost a sardine style um, on our mats just to get it be able to get enough people into the facility and in a safe place. At this point I had watched the fire kind of crest over the hill and come down into their backyard and um, she went straight back into the house to get her cell phone for work. You know, I could appreciate that. She said she was a doctor. I get it. And I went running back in her house to find her. And 
and she just wasn't going. And I, that's the one time during the night it, it became personal and, and I said, listen, my kids aren't gonna lose their mom because you're looking for a cell phone. You, you couldn't see. You couldn't see when they got into cul-de-sacs to evacuate people, they couldn't figure out how to get back. Hopefully I can get out of here. So, you know, they're asking on the radio, get me out of here, you know, through GPS and these kinds of things. I went out in the backyard and I saw big amber land and started a spot fire. So I grabbed the garden hose, put it out, looked over, another one fell and lit put it out, another one was falling, and I just said, this is not gonna work. So I just left. There was always concern that the hospital was gonna burn, um, mainly from the roof down. Uh, that was the biggest concern that I had. And um, just being able to pull the evacuation off in a timely manner was gonna be, gonna be important. Um, but knowing that we didn't have the resources to, to, to sustain a hospital fire attack in a high rise, uh, we grabbed all their maintenance staff, told them to grab every fire extinguisher you can find, get up on the roof and stay up there. Uh, they were finding spot fires on the roof, extinguishing those. Two of our bus drivers basically got called in right off the street by just police officers. You know, what are you doing? Can I take you now? Can you go in here and get people? That's what they did. So we loaded up uh, patients and staff and uh, took them to the, uh, the San Rafael office. They're standing outside of Kaiser and they're trying to figure out how do you evacuate a major metropolitan hospital. We still had to hold that. We cannot let the hospital catch on fire. Same thing was going on with Luther Burbank and Carl Newman that was threatening and Larkfield uh, largely was threatening Sutter, two-year-old hospital. We could not let the hospital burn that. That would be a huge impact for the community. And there were a couple other trucks that came in that needed repairs and we got those going and then it, you know, it got quiet because everybody was out busy. And uh, the last it was kind of weird. The last truck I worked on, I had to drive around the block, make sure everything was all right. <laughs> it hadn't happened in a while. Um, then I drove around the block to make sure everything was all right, and I heard him uh, call my neighborhood a complete loss. When this thing is moving, what was it? I think as fast as uh, a football field every five minutes up on Fountain Grove Ridge. For a first responder to know that it's moving that fast and still go up there and bang on people's doors, run sirens, draw them out of their houses, it's, it's why I think we have always called public safety uh, workers heroes. Um, they, they lived up to that standard above and beyond on that night. It's not something you could prepare for or even train for, you know, because it's, it's not a forest fire. It's a fire in a housing tract that's being pushed by, you know, gale force winds. Kent Porter, the photographer from the Press Democrat, who I worked with for 25 years, and he said, Fountain Grove is gone. And he said, um, you know, the Round Barn is gone. The, the Hilton is gone. Um, and he said, I think Coffee Park is gone, too. And hearing those words, it was like unbelievable. You know, they have a, a term called area ignition. And what that means is when an area gets preheated like that and then the, the fire moves into it, it just, it's like an explosion of flames. It's just amazing, uh, things that are, are unbelievable. We really weren't able to do uh, really valuable anchor and holding until five or six in the morning. And that's when the wind lifted. It was still windy, but the wind shifted up and went upward instead of down towards us. But wherever the fire's edge is, We'd hook into a hydrant and we would stretch lines and we would try to make sure that fire did not get past us. Panels from uh, metal garage doors that had gotten carried in the wind and ended up 50 or 60 feet up in redwood trees. Um, you know, it was just the, the whole image of, of pure destruction, really. The, you know, it's one of the first questions you ask as a chief, especially, is everybody okay? Do we have everybody accounted for? We had to make tough decisions to not get sucked into things burning on the interior because it left a hole in the gap to allow that fire to continue. So we had to make some big level strategic decisions 
um, and then we just gave those assignments um, very broad, uh, told them what the, what the objectives was and what the, what the plan was and how to box this thing in and let them do their thing. It was shocking to wake up the next morning and start you know, contacting the city offices in the way that I normally would and discover even then it wasn't contained how big it was and how big it would continue to grow. We found out about nine in the, the morning that my house was burned down and my whole neighborhood was burned down and I was also in contact with the EOC and as soon as they found out that I lost my home and my car and all my belongings they knew I had to get clothes and a rental car and I had a lot to do but I really wanted to come to work and see how everybody was doing and see how it was going at the shelter so once I found my mom and the kids a place to stay, I came to work. Our supervisor said, the backup people is showed up so you guys could go home. What is my home? I was standing down there. Everybody jumped their cars, they left. And I was standing down there and thinking, what could I call home? And I, I was working with people in the EOC who knew that they probably lost their home and they kept just trying to deliver the best response, even through the fact that they knew in their heart of hearts they had probably lost their home. For them to know that, okay, I got my family out and I know my family's safe now, and then to come back in, to go back into that is, most people think it's crazy, but you know, it's just, in my mind, it's heroic. I knew after a period of time, I, I knew my wife was safe and my kids were safe and the animals were safe. They actually came into the evacuation center so I got to see them personally, which, was helpful. <laughs> so once I knew they were safe and that was safe, nothing else seemed to really matter in the moment other than helping out these other 700 plus people that are in the facility and trying to make their lives as comfortable and safe as possible and hopefully trying to find out about their loved ones and making sure that again they have their family members are safe and so really I was able to turn the focus away from myself and just focus on the needs for the, again, hundreds of people that were, were in our center and, and trying to make it a, a, the best possible experience in a negative situation for them. It's an incredible testament to people's dedication to this community that you could lose everything, make sure your family is safe, and then come back and work. In some ways, it may have been for them what they needed. They needed to be able to grasp onto something that's in their control um, versus not being in control because I needed them here, I needed them working, I needed them uh, being here and also um, being able to emotionally withstand that too. And that's, that's tough. Everybody was just dog tired by day two or three because they'd been operating for days on end without, without sleep or if they were able to get it, it was an hour here, an hour there. We had mentioned the local assistance center, we called it the LAC, the LAC. And that was really an amazing experience and I spent most of the time, I think, probably two weeks into the fire for then the next three or four weeks there. As we all did, we'd rotate shifts. And it was just where all of the different agencies and departments that you would need to deal with to basically rebuild your life were all located in one spot. So the city government uh, departments were there, county, DMV, anything, social security, and you could go from station to station and talk to those people and, and get information. You could get your driver's license and things like that. And the, uh, as they were ramping that up, the people that were coordinating that would kind of have a debrief in the morning, and I was right there at the very beginning. And one of the thing that they, things that they told us, which I thought was really uh, thoughtful, try the best that you can to put yourself in the shoes of the people coming to see you. They just lost everything. Their house, their belongings, their clothes, everything. From Friday morning, I was heading into the EOC and we were getting ready to evacuate Rankin Valley because of the fires approaching and how people were so tense at that point that when we issued the evacuation order for Rankin Valley, we, we cleared out the entire community. I mean, it's probably 15,000 people cleared out in a matter of maybe 35, 40 minutes. You know, I, I think everybody that was in the area, myself included, you know, with my wife calling me going, what do I pack? I go, anything you can't buy on Amazon. You know, even walking her through that while I'm trying to, I'm sitting at the EOC working through each one of these problems. And everybody in that EOC, every city employee, everybody that was there was kind of struggling through some of the same stuff personally. The number of missing persons and people that reported 
that we're missing and then we have to try to track people down and coordinating that with the sheriff's department to figure out exactly you know how do you take you know 2,000 reported missing people and then start finding them so that people know that their loved ones are accounted for or somebody you know they knew or what have you I mean, it, it, every time it was a challenge to get your arms around it you take care of the problem work the problem and then uh, try to get the right resources to it no organization no government could afford enough firefighters to deal with the biggest fires that, that are going to happen. This one was way beyond that, but even, even regular big fires, you need help. If I recall, at one point there were seven or 8,000 firefighters camped out at the fairgrounds. Um, there were hundreds and hundreds of fire trucks from all over the place. It was the biggest fire camp they ever made. We took over the, the Santa Rosa fairgrounds. Um, and we used every every inch of it. We had crews out there for four or five days straight, and that was a challenge getting people to come in, especially the the local folks, Santa Rosa and the Rincon Valleys and the Sebastopols. They were out there for a long time. I think we had almost 150 officers from out of the area on Monday night, and then it grew from there uh, over 250. Um, for Santa Rosa alone, and um, what I tried to do uh, in the morning at 6 a.m. and at 6 p.m. is be there to kind of shake people's hands and thank them. Because they're coming in trying to help us get a handle on this thing. There's no way we could have done it, even with, I mean, I had over 100 officers almost every shift working. Even National Guard, when we finally got a handle locked down on the neighborhoods and kind of getting control of it, um, the National Guardsmen that gave up you know, their personal lives to be there and help and stand a post. We went about two weeks where we kept all of the, all of the neighborhoods locked down um, with the National Guard and we pulled a team together on the Monday the 16th. Ultimately it was trying to get about 15,000 people back onto the properties. It, it was a challenge. I mean, it was a mental challenge and um, we, we weren't quite yet done with the firefight on one end because we were still seeing some movement over on the east side of town, but we still needed to find a way of getting folks uh, back, back to, their, to their properties. Uh, and we really tried to roll up the sleeves to figure out how is this gonna work and how are we gonna make it so that um, we're really giving folks that quiet opportunity without having uh, a lot of bystanders who really don't belong there participating in their in their moment. I drove into a cul-de-sac up on Fountain Grove and um, I, there were four, uh, four or five cars from a neighboring agency, a mutual aid agency, and I'm going, what is going on up here? And I get out and there's all these officers digging through the rubble and there's a couple homeowners, elderly, and they found the woman's wedding ring. And I was, at first, as a, you know, you know, an administrator or a manager, you're going, hey, get, get out of there. You don't need to be, you know, we need to be doing, but when you hear a story like that, you can't help but go, God, that, that made all the difference <laughs> in the world to that elderly couple. What I found is all the titles strip away. You're sitting next to the city manager who's in jeans and a ball cap and you've got Ray Navarro, your police captain, and, and any other number of people you would never really see in a setting, you know, that informally and yet they're just like everyone else and they're just trying to help people. People that were usually really well put together were literally in sweats, a baseball cap, but everybody was busily working to figure out how that room was going to function. We had some training in advance, but honestly, I don't know what kind of training can prepare you for that. You do a lot of training, but you're never, it's never gonna be exactly like that when something happens. I said, I've been through the floods and the river for like 10 years, 10 times we've activated, and it's different every time. I said, you can't have a drill and you know, be prepared for every instance. When you look at it from a standpoint, from a police department standpoint, we don't train to get chased through the city by a fire. Um, but the amazing things that employees did 
are, are still coming out today. Uh, I know the city workers were everywhere trying to keep up with us. They had flows coming in as fast as they could turn pumps on and keep them coming. But like take for example down uh, near Coffee Park or the commercial area off of Piner. At one point I remember driving by and seeing multiple fire engines hooked up to large diameter hoses off a hydrant, a hydrant, a hydrant. Well, on a perfect day with no fire anywhere else, any water system is going to struggle to keep up with that. The post office that made deliveries and figured out how to provide service in areas that were decimated. The city staff, um, you know, you don't think about staff like the water agency staff being a first responder. They're not technically a first responder, but their response was essential. In public safety, we're used to kind of dealing with kind of the unknown. A lot of other city departments are not. They're used to, they have a very structured kind of process and what have you. But this city and government in general came together during that period of time to get stuff done. And I, I mean, I'll give you an example. We could not have evacuated some of the areas we evacuated if our city bus drivers didn't get in a bus and drive through smoke they couldn't see to get to us. Couldn't have done it. We didn't have enough people. We didn't have enough resources. Buses showed up, loaded people, got them down. Coming to work, jumping in buses and driving through flames to get people out of their care facilities. Um, you know, I, I get paid to risk my life. They don't. Those are the kinds of things that went on every day. And whether or not it was a bus driver, public works guy moving uh, cars so we could get traffic flowing through an area, doesn't matter. Every little bit makes a difference in keeping the community safe. But when it all was said and done, everybody showed up. But then you take the recreation and park staff, let's say who work at Family Center, that turned into an emergency shelter. So you go to work thinking you're wrecking parks, you do, you know, you just manage the facility. Well, now all of a sudden people are living there. People with different needs, wants, and not a great situation. But they, they were very flexible, they made it work. And then again, we talked about the outpouring of community support. One of the first times I drove up to Finley, the amount of donations flooding, and I mean flooding into Finley Center, was impressive because everyone wanted to help. For the first couple of days, it's like, okay, so how are we gonna manage this 24 hours a day without knowing how long we're gonna be open? So we just had to come up with a plan. They were faced with a lot of scared people and, you know, just, so much chaos in the community and, and I saw them as comforting people and doing a great job and then not only that but with you know supplies were running out the building had to constantly be cleaned they had to come up with a management plan, plan for all the donations so not only were they taking care of people but there were all these issues that they were dealing with that we don't normally have at work. It was a, a very uh, interesting thing to visit the shelters during, during that time, uh, not knowing what to expect, uh, not knowing where people are in their place. Uh, you know, it was a very traumatic uh, incident for the entire county, really. Uh, so going there, it's almost like uh, kind of reverting back to when I was a cop, when you're kind of dealing with people who've been through difficult times. It could be, uh, it could be a house fire, it could be the loss of somebody. You know, what, what do you say? And, and at the end, it comes down to just being there. It's just being there and giving people an opportunity to share and talk if they want to, uh, respecting their space and also respecting their privacy, even though they're in this big communal area where there really isn't any privacy, but there is still a sense of privacy. Firefighters who lost their home were still at the front line fighting the fire. And a couple nights in, I stopped by the Union Hall uh, in downtown Santa Rosa and there were a phone bank going of retired firefighters who had come in uh, specifically to start the insurance process for the firefighters still fighting the blaze. And it was a pretty incredible moment to see these retired firefighters uh, taking care of their own and, and really making sure that they were taking care of the people who were taking care of us. Communities outside like the uh, county of San Luis Obispo sent hundreds of postcards from individuals with handwritten notes comforting the people that were in the evacuation center, so that was really nice. And then at some point, it starts to transition into, this is crazy, like this is our town, this is, you know, many of the people that work with us, they grew up here or they've been with us for so long, they've got family in the area, you know, so you start to look at all the historical landmarks that we lost or the significant buildings that we lost. I mean, to, to lose a Kmart in a wildland fire is, is crazy. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make sense 
mentally. Kmart has been completely destroyed, but you don't really grasp the magnitude of the fire until after you come out here and take a look at it in person. It's, uh, it's just, it's incredible. Um, you know, none of us have ever seen anything like this. Uh, we're talking to the mutual aid officers that are coming in, and they're saying the same thing. This is the, uh, uh, you know, the biggest thing in our, in our careers uh, that, has, that has impacted us. It's uh, really difficult to kind of find your way around this whole area. Uh, we don't have any more landmarks. We used to, you know, even though you, it, we know the streets, um, a lot of times we're coming into areas and we're looking for uh, the landmarks. So we know a specific house, maybe a color. We're coming in here now and we don't even recognize anything. Jeez, look at this. <laughs> Fire truck. <laughs> it's fascinating to me because I was asking after, you know, a couple weeks after, going, hey, you know, it'd be nice to hear some of the stories. And you know, the number one comment that people made to me, no, nah, we're just doing our job. It's all good. <laughs> I go, no, you don't get chased by fire, and that's your job. That's not something that we train for, it's not something that we do every day. It's something that happened. Um, you know, we got to really kind of try to acknowledge that. It was, it was terrifying. And that's one thing I had mentioned to the chief when he was asking about stories. And, you know, we're not getting a lot back from the officers. And I pulled him aside and I said, that's because if we admit that we were pretty scared because we weren't trained for it and we weren't even really, um, we didn't even really have the protective equipment we really did need. And that's okay. It worked out. But, I mean, if we all are honest, we're... This was a terrifying thing. We lost 24 people, and the reason why we didn't lose more is because the community really came together and helped each other get, get out, whether it was, they didn't even live in the area. I'm hearing a fire, I better call my friend Joe, and hey, there's a fire, what, there is? You know, I don't know how many stories I heard about that, or Facebook, or text message, or pick something. We, we can't do it by ourselves, placing fire and with something that large. Um, there's just, there's no way. I can't think of one instance for weeks, if not a couple of months, from the start of the fire, two months out, where I didn't have an interaction with anybody, whether it was a coworker, whether it was a supervisor, whether it was somebody, a member of the public, that wasn't completely generous, patient, uh, thoughtful, kind. Everything was focused on this. Uh, it was across the board. I can't think of one instance where anyone said, yeah, that's too bad, but what about me? And I need to get back to my own thing. To be honest with you, I hear a lot about, oh, first responders, first responders, first responders. But the reality is, if, if you're a neighbor and you're knocking on doors, that is a first responder. That helped get people out. That woke somebody up who probably woke somebody else up. We couldn't have done it without it. We would have, this disaster would have been much, much worse in terms of life if it wasn't for all the people pitching in, not just the center of the police department or the fire department or the sheriff's department, CHP, it was everybody. One of the things I did was I went to um, L.C. Allen High School where, where folks were taking shelter. I think there were probably more volunteers than there were evacuees, people just wanting to help. I, w I went in and I was talking to um, Mary Gail Stabline, the principal of L.C. Allen High School. She was there at the shelter. And two men came in and said that they, had, they wanted to bring some pizzas to the shelter. And um, she said, sure, we'll, we'll take whatever you got. And they said, will 75 pizzas be enough? <laughs> and so I, I asked them, you know, where are you going to get 75 pizzas? And they said, well, we're Mountain Mike's. They lost one of their restaurants in the fire up by Kmart. So here they are. They've just suffered a serious blow to their business. And they're, they're going around asking, how many pizzas do you need? Dozens of community members driving around in their personal vehicles with uh, brown bag lunches that them and their kids made. And I could just picture this family with, you know, jars of peanut butter and jelly and bread spread all over the counter like an assembly line, making as many uh, sack lunches as they could and just driving around giving them to our, our National Guard soldiers, our police officers, deputies, allied agencies, just making sure we were taken care of. I was out uh, kind of in the Rincon Ridge part 
This person flagged me down and said, you know, we, we need help. Well, there's a, there's a cat in the storm drain and someone needs to rescue the cat. And about the time that I'm sitting in my car trying to figure out which number I'm gonna call, here comes the guy from the neighboring property with a ladder and they plug in and start going down and then they rescue this cat that had been down there before I even was able to, to get someone on the line to get someone over there to help and assist them. Um, I mean, it, pe people were definitely there to help other people. For our department, the message from the top all the way down is anything and everything you can do to help facilitate housing development, do it. Our life really took off after that because we were front and center with trying to rebuild. So, you know, other staff members, and we had all, you know, some role in it, had to rewrite the rules because they didn't really exist. How do you take subdivisions that were built in mass and now rebuild them one lot at a time where everybody wants to do something a little differently. The rules really weren't set up for that. I think that thought process started at that moment. We're thinking about how do we put the fire out? How do we help people immediately? But we know there's this huge lift that, that we've got to help support the community through. Met a couple of other families up in the Fountain Grove area. One of them was really focused in on, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to go to that next step and they wanted me to start talking to them specifically about where are we going, what's the next step, why can't we get there faster, what's the process going to look like. It's also materials, supplies, people. So every, every as we go through the development, you know, first where are we getting all this concrete? Who's going to be able to clear, clear these sites? How are we going to do every single phase? Uh, you drive through Coffee Park today, um, like we did two days ago, you, you see a lot of homes starting to go up, which is, um, I think, helpful. It's part of the healing process to see people come back and people move back in and move on. Talk about bittersweet. Those folks are out there building their homes and they're not all the same house. There's some real creative changes happening out there. So it's bittersweet. You know, you still see a lot of um, clear cut or charred trees, but the grounds are ready for, for building, but you can see people's homes going up. An interesting thing about all of this, you know, we've mentioned the regulations and we've, we've revised them, we've looked at alternative ways to redevelop, and I think through that we're learning lessons that, you know, you always look in the tragedy, where's the good, can you find any good out of it, and if anything, I think we're showing that we can rebuild, we can build in a expedited manner and do it in a high quality fashion and it's not going to destroy all of the things in the city that we love and so hopefully some of those things will be able to translate and I say hopefully they are actually they're translating citywide to make development and permitting uh, a better process for people. I'm just amazed everybody's going 100 miles an hour still and I don't hear people complaining about it. I see how hard people are working. I'm glad to have a, 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 a role and a purpose and be able to contribute to, to the cause. And I think that everybody feels that way. The thing I'm absolutely the most proud of is that we, the citizens, the community, Sonoma County, firefighters, law enforcement, everybody saved lives. I work with the best people in the world and um, to come in and, and, and deal with what they dealt with through that night, um, my hat's off to them. They, they were truly amazing, especially the fact that our communication level was, was almost zero. Somebody came up to me who wasn't from the area after the fire, but who had been here and was here after the fact to help us rebuild and kind of get going again. And he did this for a living. He moved around to disaster ravaged communities and tried to help them uh, streamline their policy process. and and get people connected with resources to recover. And I remember that he said that um, there was a lot of things being done right, there were some things being done wrong in this community, but the one thing uh, for sure was that he has never seen a community as compassionate as Santa Rosa. What was really unique was I, I, I was seeing the community give to the evacuation center. It was just amazing to watch the outreach and the caring within the community. It was also am amazing to see my staff every day just coming to work and 
being so happy to just help the people that were there. Some people talk about the first responders as you know, the heroes, and they are without question. But there's thousands, thousands of heroes just in the different neighborhoods, whether they're, they're watering their neighbor's yard, making sure the 90-year-old in, uh, in your neighborhood is being taken care of, that they're getting out safe, taking responsibility, and not waiting for the city, the county, or anyone else to do what needs to be done, just taking action, working together with the common goals. You know, I am uh, constantly amazed at the generosity of this community. I mean, just disaster aside, the generosity in this community and giving and the community-based organizations and everything else. During the fire, this community came together and galvanized in a way I've never seen before. I, I never experienced this much love that comes from everybody. And part of what kept me going is when I see the community, how much they care. This fire brought love to this city.